Some of you will remember that last week, uh, when we were finishing that four-part series, uh, Saved by Grace Through Faith for Works, and we unpacked four words. When we talked about works last week, uh, we got into James chapter 2, which basically says, faith without works, faith without action, is dead. And then the very next chapter begins to talk about what actions, and specifically with our speech. True or false? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. True or false? Good. I wish it were true, but too often it is false, isn't it? Words hurt. We see that in our media right now with teen suicides. Eight girls arrested in London for cyberbullying on Thursday. Words hurt. Often what's said, sometimes what's left unsaid. And words can help and heal and build and inspire and encourage. Speech is tremendously important. So I'm going to, I'm going to read you from John chapter 3, and we're going to unpack a whole bunch of aspects of that. What's left unsaid, what is said, how to say things. We're going to try and think collectively and creatively about this. But listen to this translation of James 3. Our speech, the words we utter, are of tremendous importance. They have an impact upon our interpersonal relationships that is far greater than the energy involved in speaking those words. We must speak softly and carefully, and in many cases, only after we have listened intensely. Our words have the power to destroy. A small leak can lead to the flooding of a large city. A little spark may set a forest on fire. The wrong word in the wrong place is capable of bringing darkness and division into the hearts of trusting people. On the other hand, the right word at the right time can put a bit of heaven into the hell that afflicts the lives of countless people. Thus, the tongue that forms our words may be an instrument of God or a tool of the devil, a vehicle of love or the instigator and perpetrator, perpetuator of hatred. It can endear us to our fellow persons or drive a wedge between us, enrich our community or divide it asunder. As a spring of water has a source, be it bitter or pure, so the flow of words, whose source is the mind and heart of man and woman. It is when our lives are centered upon God, bathed in love and dedicated to God's purposes, that the words we speak and the actions that we take reach out to bless rather than destroy and produce healing and strength, light and joy to the spiritually maimed, the suffering, and those who walk in darkness. And then James 3 ends with this. May God teach us how to speak and act wisely, not out of the ambition of self-seeking and serving, but out of the joy and grace and peace of God's Spirit within us. I read that this week, and I thought, that is a spectacularly insightful paraphrase translation of James chapter 3. It was the best version of James 3 I found anywhere. What we say can wound and it can heal. What we don't say can calm or it can discourage and depress, all depending on the situation and the person. So let's look at this and let's look first at words unsaid. We must not only be careful of saying negative things, but also of the things that we don't say, that we leave unsaid. Dr. Howard Hendricks was counseling a couple in his office one day. The couple had been married 
for nearly 20 years, but they were considering getting a divorce. And Dr. Hendricks, after conversation, he started to sniff out something, and he asked the husband, when was the last time you told your wife you love, I love you? After some thought and fidgeting, the husband replied, on my wedding day I told my wife that I loved her, and it stands until I revoke it. <laughs> yeah. Probably not enough. Now, I want to make something clear. There's a saying going around that says, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. And that sounds okay on paper. But the thing we must learn is the words that are not said, that we neglect to say, can also hurt or malnourish the spirit. Therefore, not only should we avoid speaking words against someone, we should also try to find something good to say. If we could practice this principle in our families, in our workplaces, it would have an amazing impact. First of all, on our spouse or children, and on our co-workers. If we could find something positive to say about someone instead of first noticing something negative. And it's easy to see what's a little off, what's wrong. But if we first find something positive, it will change your own attitude, and it will change the attitude of the people you're talking to. Just try it next time you're at Fortino's and, and the checkout cashier is having a hard day. Smile and thank and in your words, bless. And see their attitude change. But even if you don't see their attitude change, give them that verbal nourishment. All right, let me talk about negative words. And I want to share uh, something that I think I used one time uh, before with some of you. There was a man who decided to try and be a monk, and so he joined a silent monastery. It was a Trappist monastery. Guy Chabreau and I have gone to a Trappist monastery regularly over the years. This, this man who was trying to be a monk, he went to this Trappist monastery where you were allowed to say only two words in a year. Two words per year. Yeah. After the first year, the man had his meeting with the uh, abbot of the monastery, Père Maurice, and he came in and sat down and he said, food bad. <laughs> the next year, he worked, came in again, sat down, bed hard. Went back out, worked another year, came in, sat down, looked at Père Maurice, Father Maurice, and he said, I quit. <laughs> and Father Maurice said, I'm not surprised, you've been complaining ever since you got here. <laughs> now, I... You get the point, don't always be negative, even if it's only once a year with two words you have to say. But I want to be careful here. James is not for a moment saying that silence, complete silence, is better than speech. He's not pleading for us all to live a monk's life where our speech is or complaining is forbidden. What James is saying in James chapter 3 is control and balance. I don't know, have you ever been in the room with someone, when they walk into the room, the lights go dim. They, they just are constantly draining any kind of positive energy or any kind of joy and enthusiasm, whether it's in the conversation or the activity or just the group. Again, I, I heard of a story of a wife who was always complaining. Did, and her husband was determined to show her something that she could be positive about. So he was a hunter and he took her out to a lake to duck hunt with his new dog. 
And this new dog was good. So when the ducks flew, he was able to bag one. It went down into the lake. And he sent the dog out, and the dog ran across the surface of the water, picked up the bird, brought it back, and the wife sat there and looked, and then she said, What's the matter? Your dog can't swim? (laughs) Yeah, think about it. Okay, You don't meet many negative people who are happy. The problem is, Just as positive words are contagious, so are negative words, and they develop develop negative thinking. It it almost snowballs. And if you you ever notice in an office conversation or a neighborhood conversation, once you start complaining about something, whether it's the government uh, or the neighbor, once you start, it just snowballs, and everybody one-ups on the negativity. Listen to what the Bible says about it. Maybe you've heard this one. Proverbs chapter uh, 26. A charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. A quarrelsome negative guy will just kindle strife. Now, just to keep gender balance here, the next chapter, Proverbs 27, a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. (laughs) I didn't write this. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hands. (laughs) Some of you guys are laughing too hard. Just cut it out. I I really like what Jesus says. This is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Never criticize or condemn, or it will come back on you. Most of us know that from King James or NIV. Judge not, lest ye be judged. That's Jesus. The power of negativity and negative words. It's, as much, it's so much easier than to think and find what's positive. And that's why positive takes practice. And I hear too many people give the excuse, well, that's just the way I am. That's not biblical. That's not the way you're supposed to be. It may be the way you are. Change. It's not the way you're supposed to be. I don't know if you've ever heard the statement, a child needs at least seven positive comments to overcome one negative one. And it's true. Psychologically, emotionally, all of us as humans, especially children, need that positive affirmation. Because words wound if they go negative. So we need to we need to be able to be honest. We need to be able to speak the truth. But as Jesus said, do it in love. Speak the truth in love. I think it's the optimist and maybe it's the Rotary Club that has a a three point. And somebody correct me. If you're going to say anything, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it necessary? Is that optimist or Rotary? Anybody know? Rotary? All right. Whoever said that... That is very helpful. If you're going to make a comment, is it true? Not just passing on something you heard. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it going to do any good to pass this on? And is it really necessary that you say this? Telling others the truth is a bit of an art. I need to learn how to do this. So do you. It takes thought and care and practice. And we need to be able to say to someone the truth, but we need to do it in ways that don't wound. And usually you need to begin with an affirmation. I won't hear... Okay, I'm going to go off script here and tell you an honest example from me. First couple years we were married, and the first couple years I was ordained, when I was learning to preach... I'd read Nancy my sermon Saturday nights, 
And she really is my best critic in the Roger Ebert sense of critique and evaluate. And so she was able to pinpoint all of the, or that story doesn't fit. And I don't, how did you get from there to there? She could just, she was great. Except I couldn't hear it. I mean, maybe I was young and too defensive, but I, I could not hear it unless she said, boy, I like where you went with that. Your conclusion inspired me. So I knew there was something, if she gave me that, then I could listen how to improve. But if she just gave me the critique, I went for a lot of long walks on Saturday nights. I can remember walking half of New Brunswick. Whoa. We're good though, Isabel. <laughs> I learned and she learned and it's all good. I want to emphasize the complete flip side of all of this. So now I'm shifting away just from us speaking negative, which we shouldn't do. We can give honest critique but you have to do it with care and with love. Now let me go to the other side of this. What about when we hear criticism, negativity about us? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That children's rhyme is meant to encourage and bolster young people to ignore the taunt, to refrain from retaliation, and to remain calm and good-natured. But sometimes that's hard to do. And we're seeing that in our culture now. Teens are... Uh, there's a real danger of a culture of bullying. And fortunately, it's being noticed and we're addressing it. How does one respond to criticism? When you're 15, when you're 13, you're not really strong enough yet and mature enough to respond to criticism unless you have a lot of balance and protection around you. But as we grow, we should be able to. And, well, let me give you one example from history. General Robert E. Lee was once asked what he thought. He, he was one of the, he was the top general in the American Civil War on the Confederate side. And apparently, from all the history, he was a, a great gentleman and a man of integrity, despite the fact that he fought with the South. But he was once asked what he thought of a fellow officer in the Confederate Army. Now, this officer had made some very mean-spirited remarks about General Lee. Lee thought for a moment when asked about this other officer, and then he rated him as being very satisfactory. The person who asked the question seemed troubled and said, but General, I guess you don't know what he's been saying about you. Oh yes, answered Lee, I know, but I was asked my opinion of him, not his opinion of me. That's maturity, and that's perspective. Can, can I grow to be that strong? where someone's negativity or their criticism does not permanently wound or make me negative and bitter. And here's where your faith and the belief system that you instill in the children around you, here's where that is so valuable. Sometimes we think, Jesus loves me, that little song, that you learned as a four-year-old. Sometimes we think it's just a simple childish song. It's much more than that. It has profound spiritual, emotional, and psychological value. To know from your earliest memories that the true creator of this vast, complex universe has come in Jesus to show and give the world eternal love. To know that is fortifying beyond measure. I believe, I believe we ought to be coated with Teflon. Jesus' team ought to be Teflon coated. Nothing sticks. It just slides off. 
We know that we are loved by God. And our value comes from that. Other opinions don't matter nearly as much. We can always learn from correction and critique. So I'm not saying you don't listen. You listen to complaints and criticisms and hear what's true and learn and grow from it. Change and fix all that you can. But never be shaken or diminished in your certainty of what a pre precious, loved person you are. Because God made you and came in Jesus to show you that love. So I hope that you and the generations coming behind us retain emotional intelligence and fortitude because of what we know deep inside that cannot be battered or shaken. And that's why we need to be teaching our children and our teens in adolescence when they're so fragile. We need to be teaching them how precious they are and how important they always will be. Value people and build them up. Positive words help create a positive climate. So I want to, I want to finish by just talking about how we can be positive and encouraging and affirming to people. I believe Paul, St. Paul understood this when he wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's wise counsel. How much more could this be applied to our families, our marriages, our workplace, all our neighborhoods, everywhere? Some of you may remember Dr. Paul Tournier. He was a Swiss psychiatrist, a man of profound spirituality and a committed Christian. He wrote and was heavily, greatly influential back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He wrote very sensitively and beautifully, and in one of his books, he talks about a debate that he had with one of his colleagues. This other man said, what everybody wants more than anything else is to have freedom and equality. And Tournier agreed. Those things are indeed important to people, but Tournier added that people need also to be important, to be needed, to be someone. Take me seriously, Tournier said, is almost the cry of every heart. Even if I don't have a university degree, take me seriously. Even if I'm a laborer, take me seriously. Even if I am black, and he was writing in the 50s for this part during the civil rights movement, even if I am black, take me seriously. Even if I am a woman, take me seriously. Even if I have no money, take me seriously. Even if I am an immigrant, take me seriously. Even if I am a little child, take me seriously. Recognize me as a person with something valid to say. Take me seriously, I am not a nobody, I am a somebody. When we begin to take that perspective and see every person with the measure of value that God sees them, it will change our speech. There will be therapeutic words coming from us. And there are ways that you can change a life with a single sentence. It will so impact. The greatest example I've heard comes from a young woman named Marianne Bird. And I want to read you from her autobiography. I want to read you the single sentence that changed her life. Listen. I grew up knowing I was different and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate. And when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I must look to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When schoolmates would ask, what happened to your lip? 
I tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could love me or even like me. And then I entered Mrs. Leonard's second grade class. Mrs. Leonard was round and pretty and fragrant with shining brown hair and warm, dark, smiling eyes. Everyone adored her, but no one came to love her more than I did, and for a special reason. The time came for the annual hearing tests given at our school. I could barely hear out of one ear and was not about to reveal something else that would single me out as different, so I cheated on the hearing test. The whisper test required each child to go to the classroom door turn sideways, close one ear with a finger while the teacher whispered something from her desk, which the child then repeated. Then the same for the other ear. And nobody checked how tightly the untested ear was covered, so I merely pretended to block mine. As usual, I was last, but all through the testing, I wondered what Mrs. Leonard might say to me. I knew from previous years that the teacher whispered things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? My time came. I turned my bad ear toward her, plugging up the other one just enough to be able to hear, and I waited. And then came the words that God had surely put into her mouth, seven words that changed my life forever. Mrs. Leonard, the teacher I adored, said, Softly, I wish you were my little girl. Oh, have you ever had somebody say something like that to you that made such a profound difference in your life? Something that built you up, that healed a wound, that just loved you in one sentence. Scripture says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. Choose praise. Choose affirmation. Choose Jesus' speech. Let us pray. Jesus, give us holy thoughts and loving words in all our days.